You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 152 of the Common Descent Podcast. We're back after a hiatus. It didn't feel like a hiatus to any of you, (laughs) but to us, it feels like a hiatus. Yeah, it has actually been a month since we've recorded. (laughs) Yeah, you, you, as far as you're concerned, we were releasing stuff all through October, but (laughs) most of that, all of that was recorded ahead of time. Yes. So we're back. This episode, our topic is the Jehol Biota, a world famous fossil ecosystem from China. We have done a bunch of fossil locality episodes in the past. This one is very exciting because not only is it relatively more newly famous Mm -hmm. than some of the other sites we've discovered, but also it has yielded some of the most famous fossils of our time. Yeah, it's fascinating because it's not quite as, you know, common household of a name as like Burgess Shale or right. La Brea, where these are these have been famous for decades and decades and decades. This is a newer fossil site, you know, relatively speaking. But you've heard of the discoveries from this site. Yes. We've <laughs> mentioned this area, this this ecosystem, tons of times on the podcast, often when we're talking about dinosaur fossils, bird fossils, fossils with feathers and soft tissue and coloration. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Tons of that stuff is coming out of the Jahol Biota. And in this episode, we will discuss what it is and where it is and some of the history of discovery and what sort of awesome fossil remains have been found there. All that and more to come in the main discussion, which is after the news, which is after the announcements, which is after I mentioned that this episode topic, like all of our episode topics, was requested. Sure was. This topic's requesters are Jim, Klaus, Jackie... Paleo Tristan and Franco Speaks. Good job requesting something that's not always at the forefront. Like, I feel like this is not a thing I would have expected to get a decent list of requests from. So good job. And now some announcements. As always, this podcast is supported entirely by our Patreon. We've got a bunch of generous and dedicated patrons who help us to support the podcast, to fund all the things that we do who get to enjoy all sorts of cool bonus goodies like live streams and bonus content, director's notes for each episode, things like that. As longtime listeners know, if patrons sign up at a certain level, they get a shout out on the podcast. So this episode, we would like to give welcomes and shout outs to Bibble, Christina, Joao, Jovian, Tobias, and a happy birthday to Kathy. Thanks, everyone, and happy birthday, Kathy. (laughs) Thank you all. Anyone out there who is not already supporting us on Patreon, if you'd like to support our science education endeavors, follow the link that is in the episode description and also anywhere that we can find a place to put it on our online presence. Mm -hmm. Go check out Patreon. We'd be happy to have you. Speaking of ways to get in touch with us and to support us, you know, emotionally... Also down in the episode description, there is a physical mailing address, which many of our listeners have taken advantage of to send us goodies. We've got a bunch of goodies uh, that we've gotten recently. Yeah, we have. Since we haven't recorded in a month. (laughs) Just this today, as of this recording, we picked up a box of stuff from our listener Serpentine, Mm -hmm. who sent us a bunch of treats and things. Yeah, some Australian candies and snacks. All the way from down under. A couple of figurines of Australivinator, the the dinosaur. Yeah, who has a name. Banjo. I'm pretty sure sure Banjo was the name of the Australivinator from that museum. Right, yes. That's that's why it says Banjo. Yep, yep. Well, because it was on the list, I think the, the postcard mm-hmm. said in here, two banjos. And for a second, <laughs> I was like, that this box isn't big enough to have two banjos in it. <laughs> but they are little figurines of this dinosaur. So it is now up on my shelf with all my other theropods. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Serpentine. Uh, we will enjoy eating all of the upside down treats that you have sent to us. <laughs> also, we received a... I don't even know how to describe this. A piece of, a work of stained glass. Yeah, a stained glass window fixture to to hang in your window. Yeah, from Lisa. Mm Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It's very colorful. It's got dinosaur faces. Yeah, like three dinosaur portraits in it. And you can't 
see them clearly until the light comes through, which makes it really cool. Yeah. It's a really awesome effect. A very, j- just really well made and exciting. We, we were so excited to get it. We didn't believe it. We, we actually, a bunch of our patrons know that we got this because we opened it mm-hmm. on one of the Patreon live streams. So they got to see us react with incredulity. <laughs> And also, we got a lovely Halloween card mm-hmm. from Yayoi Neko, who has sent us stuff before. Yes. And this one had a delightful little art of Halloween cats. It is really cute. Very cute. <laughs> like, it's it's very, very adorable. <laughs> so thank you to everyone who has sent us gifts. And if you would like to send us some cool stuff, we're not, you know, begging for it or anything. But it's so cool. <laughs> if you want, go ahead and use the mailing address down in the episode description. Hey, speaking of Halloween, last month we released this year's Spooky. Yeah. Four episodes where we speculatively evolved monsters from Dungeons and Dragons. We did owl bears, Displacer Beasts, Beholders, and Mimics, and we had a blast. And got so much awesome fan art of so it. So much cool fan art. Oh. Go to our blog, link in the episode description. There is a page for fan art now. Check it all out. There's also been a whole bunch of cool spooky discussion and art in the Discord, which is also linked in the episode description. It's got its own channel, so you can find it all there. Yeah, so that was super cool. Now, that's a thing that happened. The next thing that's happening is our end-of-the-year Q&A. Every year at the end of the year, we do a big old Q&A where we answer cues from our listeners, and the form to submit your questions for the the end-of-the-year Q&A will open officially on November 15th, as it always does. We will be putting the link. It'll be in the episode descriptions. It'll be... On our social media, we'll put it everywhere. Go to the forum, submit your question. It will be open for a month from mid-November to mid-December, and then we will answer as many of those questions as we can on our eventual end-of-the-year Q&A, which will be somewhere between two and eight hours long (laughs) as we answer whatever prompts our audience has given to us to answer as we celebrate the new year. Yeah, these questions can be whatever you're interested in. People ask us scientific questions, people ask us questions about the podcast, but we also just get silly questions and personal questions about us as educators and individuals. So sure, sure. Whatever you're curious about, this is the time to ask. (laughs) Mix it up for us. And speaking of stuff that is down in the episode description, as we've mentioned in some recent episodes, we are now part of the Audible Affiliates program. We are. So if you go to the episode description and sign up for Audible using that link, you get access to all sorts of audiobooks and also help support the podcast just a little bit. Yeah, so please check that out if you're interested. Check it out. This episode, we're going to be talking a lot about dinosaurs, and I can tell you there's a lot of great dinosaur (laughs) content on Audible. There's a little (laughs) tie-in. I think that's all the things that we have to announce. I think so. It, for this episode. We that, had a lot of that announcements. That's quite enough. Because we've been away. <laughs> right. The fire hoses. <laughs> which means that we can move on to the news. News. Every episode, we like to cover some news from the world of paleontology, evolutionary science, the sorts of things that the podcast is about. Keeps everybody up to date. Will. Mm-hmm. News number one. My first news is a bit of research looking at bird skeletons and finding some interesting results as to how their skeletons differ based on the habitats they occupy. Interesting. Which is by Guillermo Navalone et al. in Nature, and the article we'll be linking to in the blog post is by Laura Bysis in Popular Science. Hey, you can find a link to the blog along with all those other links we mentioned in the episode description. Yep. So birds are extremely diverse. I've heard of them. We've mentioned that in our birds episode and just... We will mention it in this episode. (laughs) Many times. Birds are an extremely (laughs) successful group of animals today. There are roughly a bit over 10,000 species of bird on our planet today. And they occupy just about as many ecosystems as you can think of birds occupying with tons of different body shapes. And research attempting to understand this diversity has been a common question, a common focus for bird evolution. Yeah, how did you accomplish this? Yes, and what was the pattern? When did it happen? One of the things that is well known is that it sparked after the end Cretaceous extinction, 66 million years ago, when birds also were hit. Right, when most birds went extinct, Mm -hmm. along with most of the other dinosaurs. And then radiated since then. And much evidence has pointed to that they radiated, they recovered fairly quickly. Like within the first 10 million years, they had diversified notably after that extinction. This research was wanting to look at the macroevolutionary patterns. 
of birds, and they were doing it by looking at skeletal elements. They noted multiple times that this is often a form of study that is limited because they would focus on single elements or what were considered important elements. This study was trying to take a much wider look at the bird anatomy. So instead of focusing on the wing bones or the foot bones or the neck bones, it's the whole skeleton. Yeah. Now, they're still focused in on specific parts, so they weren't Mm -hmm. able to do the entirety, but they analyzed 13 skeletal elements from 228 species of modern birds. And when we say skeletal elements, we usually mean individual parts of the skeleton. Yes. So single bones is often what elements means. But they also included uh, pro- skeletal proportions, like so body proportions, mm-hmm. as well as individual skeletal features. So they gotcha. were looking at a broad image and down to very specific ones, depending on which part they were looking at and what way they were looking at it. They used 3D imaging to get a 3D view of these elements and these parts with focuses on head, wings, and legs. But this allowed them to compare the birds and attempt to, as they put it, work backwards through time to get an idea of the evolutionary trend. The reason they use modern birds is because fossil birds are not super common. They are fairly rare because birds are delicate. And they're often incomplete, which makes it hard to do a whole skeleton comparison. And so it was worded one way that by using the modern and getting a good look and a good database of modern ones, they then could fill out the timeline by just looking at the fossils, not including them in this study, you know, studying in the same way, but still being able to compare generally, as well as the relationships of the modern and molecular evolution, judging by how far these should have diverged from one another based on their genetic differences. They were able to put together an evolutionary history and find trends of speciation and how that diversity appeared. They found huge variation in the evolutionary patterns of different birds. One of the most surprising things that jumped out was a a very clear pattern between marine and terrestrial birds. That there was a distinct separation between those two groups in their evolutionary trends, in how they were evolving and what features they were tending to evolve. The water birds showed repeated patterns of exploring the morphospace, basically exploring the possible shapes that water birds can take many times throughout their history, that they were exploring the different shapes that water birds can be over and over. They emphasized changes in the proportions of the bones closer to the body core, things related to locomotion, so the elements closer to their body center than to the ends of their limbs, and noted changes in the beaks made easier for catching marine fish, which you expect. Land birds evolved a distinct body group, you know, body shape early after the KPG, and then emphasized trends that seemed to focus more on the shape of their body at the ends of their limbs, the parts where they're interacting with the environment, like the ends of their feet, their beak, you know, the end of their neck, not seeming to show the same exploration in the same parts of the body as the water birds. Like, they were showing distinct, different evolutionary patterns in what parts of their body were tending to evolve more based on where they were living. And they noticed a pattern with passerines, which are the group that includes over half of all birds, your perching birds and songbirds, showed to be more conservative in their evolutionary dynamic in that they maintained a relatively similar shape throughout their evolutionary history, with not as much variation in their skeletal elements overall. The reason this was so interesting is that it turned out, based on this study, that the mass extinction and recovering from that had less evident effect on the diversity that followed than the environments that the birds were in. That that seems to be a much stronger linking to their evolutionary diversity than just responding and recovering from a mass extinction. That there seem to be much stronger signals for habitat. That's interesting because it makes complete sense to imagine species evolving different traits in different habitats because that's what we see in evolution all the time. But this is saying that species in different habitats show different patterns of evolution. Yes. Over time. Yes. That if you're living in water, the way that these bodies are changing over time is going to show different patterns than the birds that live in terrestrial environments on land and such. And that the water 
birds are showing more similar patterns to each other. Right. Even, uh, and I, I presumably, even groups that aren't necessarily related to each other, the habitat is the strong signal. Yes. That's, that's, that's the thing that is determining whole patterns of evolution over time, not just each individual species ultimate shape and behavior. Exactly. And that there was a very, like, it was emphasized over and over, blatantly obvious distinction between mm-hmm. land and water. Right. If you just looked at the trends in evolution, you could say that well that that's a water bird. Yeah. Those that that lineage is water birds. <laughs> it's evolving like a water bird would evolve. Yes. <laughs> Which is a pretty cool we don't often think of a habitat being linked to long term trends. Yeah, that like you'd see things in spe- patterns in speciation and patterns right. in certain parts of the body more than other parts of the body. It's always weird when an unexpected pattern shows up in evolution. Yeah, it, so much of evolutionary study is just figuring out which of the million different factors involved in evolution is relatively important in which situations. Yep. That it's just it's just a thousand different pieces and trying to figure out how they all fit together. Yeah, it's it's all basically happening all at once. Which one's happening the most right now? Right. <laughs> Well, while we're on the subject, I also have a news about dinosaurs. This is about extinct dinosaurs and ones that aren't birds. <laughs> and in particular, looking at patterns, not in their evolution over time, but in their growth and development. Ooh, neat. This is research by Daniel Barta et al. in Scientific Reports. And in the blog post, we will link to a press release via Oklahoma State University. As we've often mentioned on the podcast... We tend to look at birds and crocodilians today to understand early dinosaur evolution. Because early dinosaurs are the ancestors of birds and the cousins of crocs. And so with those two points, we can try to predict things about that ancestry. Yeah, we can look for the common features that seem to overlap across all groups. Right. Or things that are different. Mm-hmm. One difference, apparently between crocs and birds, is how much they vary in their growth patterns. Oh, yeah. So within crocodilians, crocs and gators, there's a lot of variation with things like how quickly they grow or when they stop growing. So if you go from individual to individual, you'll see a lot of different patterns in those things, whereas birds tend to be more consistent. Mm -hmm, They mm -hmm. tend to grow at similar rates and start or stop various stages of their growth at relatively similar patterns. Crocs are more variable. You'll you'll hear crocs often called indeterminate growth because it's a, a gator in a good, warm, healthy, well-fed summer is going to grow way more than one in a cold, poorly fed summer. So you can get two crocs of the same age at very, very different sizes. Right, right. And it seems that some other studies have found possible evidence of a similar variability in certain early dinosaurs and cousins of early dinosaurs. Mm. So this has raised the question of, did the dinosaur lineage at its start, were they more like what we see in crocs? Or had they already developed the more consistent growth patterns that we see in modern dinosaurs, birds? Yeah. This can be an important question because any time there's variability, that's where natural selection gets to play around. If every member of a population has one feature that's exactly the same, natural selection doesn't get to do much with that. But if each individual can do something slightly different, that's a lot of variation that natural selection can play with. The ones that do better are going to survive and persist and pass on those traits. So Variation in ontogeny, right, in patterns of growth and development, can provide fertile ground for evolutionary diversification into the future. So whether early dinosaurs were one way or the other can help us understand a piece of their patterns of evolution over time. Now, one of the things that's tricky with studying fossil animals and trying to look at a population and go, all right, were they all doing the same thing or doing something different? is that usually we don't get a whole population. Usually you only get a handful of individuals. So these researchers went to Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. A famous... I don't know if they actually went to Ghost Ranch or if they were just using the fossils from Ghost Ranch. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually... I said it in a dramatic way. (laughs) Let's assume they went to Ghost Ranch. (laughs) Ghost Ranch, New Mexico is famous 
for fossils of Coelophysis, which is a small early dinosaur, early carnivorous dinosaur. Ghost Ranch has hundreds of skeletons of Coelophysis, which are thought to represent mass mortality. Like lots of animals dying at the same time due to a drought or something similar to a drought, which means that you get this whole collection of fossil animals that died at a similar time that seem to represent an extinct population of these animals, which makes it a great opportunity to study population variability. But also, there have apparently been previous studies that have looked at signs of aging in these Coelophysis fossils and found that they don't all line up the way that you might expect. So, for example, one thing that we commonly look at for a sign of aging is fusion in different bones uh, around the body. As animals get older, certain bones fuse together like a baby's head. Another thing that tends to line up with age is body size. Yep. And a previ- at least one previous study has found that those two features don't seem to match up all the time in these coelophysis, which might be a hint that they're not all growing the same way. So here they went to basically, let's double down on that and see if we can get more info. So they got 24 individuals, and they took histological samples. So they took slices through the long, the limb bones, because within the limb bones there are growth rings, kind of like tree rings, yep. that you can use to look at patterns of growth and development. Uh, we do this a lot with dinosaurs, we do this a lot with crocodilians uh, and other reptiles. And they found a couple of cool things. For one... They found that most of the Coelophysis individuals were young, okay. between one and four years old, which they pointed out could potentially be explained by there being harsh conditions that maybe they weren't living very long yeah. because uh, possibly, but that wasn't the focus of the study. The other thing they found is that once again, the growth lines, which tell you right, you have three yearly lines, mm-hmm. that is a three-year-old individual. The lines of growth, the age of each individual, did not line up with body size. Yeah. So just like you were saying about Crocs, two Coelophysis of the same body size were often not the same age. Or the same age were not the same body size. These were decoupled. Yeah. This suggests that there was a lot of variations. But the way that they specifically described it, which I thought thought was a great way to think about it, a lot of variation in how much they grew every year. Yes. That you're not growing the same amount in the same 12-month period. Well, and that that's the key to those growth patterns, because it means you grow more when things are good, and you just don't grow when things are bad. Right. And yeah, this, this trait, this variability, is thought of as something that can help animals to survive in environments where conditions are tough, or when conditions are inconsistent. Yeah, where you don't know whether you're going to have... Right. The rain might not come for two years. <laughs> right. Every few years is a bad winter. Just every time, if you're stuck growing in the same pattern every year, that can be a problem. But if you can, if, if it can be adjustable, it can potentially help animals to survive. The fact that hints of this have been found in these dinosaurs, other dinosaurs, dinosaur cousins suggest that this might have been a common trait in early dinosaurs and might even have helped them get an edge up in the unpredictable conditions, not only like just general harsh conditions, but specifically around the end of the Triassic period when things went haywire. Yes. Coelophysis is from the Triassic, uh, which I probably should have mentioned earlier, but I didn't. (laughs) But as we've discussed before, episode 15, at the end of the Triassic, there was a mass extinction that dinosaurs survived through much better than a lot of other groups. This kind of foundational variation might have been a part of what let them do that. Yeah, very cool. Well, it's neat, and I feel like this is this kind of falls into a similar category as warm-blooded versus cold-blooded, quote unquote, where it is very easy to assume that the more mammalian or the more modern way of things is the superior. Right. Yeah, that well, obviously, if birds are the modern dinosaurs and they grow at a consistent rate. That's the more highly evolved. Right. Well, they're the ones that survived. Yeah. Therefore, that must be the best option. So this primitive growth cycle, like there might, there must be something wrong with it. Right. But no, it it could very well be a boon in harsh conditions or weird conditions. Yeah. To help you survive. And that's a, it's, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't have expected us to find it in dinosaurs. That's very cool. Yeah. One other thing that I wanted to draw attention to is that if you go to the blog post and you click on the link and you read the thing, there is a quote by one of the authors, by, uh, by the, the main author, Barta, that says, Studies like this demonstrate the importance of maintaining museum collections and using new approaches to study them. Fossil bones are still full of surprises. And I wanted to highlight that because I've been noticing as the years have gone by, that sentence or sentences very much like it more and more are showing up in studies like this, emphasizing that, yeah, we didn't go dig up these 24 individuals. Mm -hmm. They were already collected and maintained in a museum. And I just think it's an interesting little peek behind the curtain that this concept has become more prevalent, that this concept expressing this idea has become more prevalent in news stories and press releases in more recent years. And I think part of that is coming from just there are more studies being done using catalogs that are already in museum collections. More and more paleontologists are realizing the value Mm -hmm. that you don't have to go to a fossil site to make new discoveries. There's tons in the museum. You can just go there and get a bunch of work done there. But also, I think it's really relevant to point out that the last few years have seen events that have brought this more to the forefront. Mm -hmm. When the pandemic hit, when COVID hit, a lot of places started losing funding and losing financial support, including lots of museums, which led lots of scientists to try to reemphasize what the importance is of maintaining good museum collections. And also it makes me think of the fire in Brazil at Brazil's museum, which happened, as was widely publicized, and we talked about it here on the podcast, partially because that museum had fallen into disrepair and yes. wasn't being maintained as well as it should have been. This idea of the importance of museums, they've always been important, but in recent years, it's becoming more important to people to mention that they're important, to not let people forget, to go, by the way, this cool study you just heard about is another reason why we should make sure that we're maintaining these good museum collections well because this is one of the aspects in which paleontology is uh most like video games in my opinion in that revisiting museum collections with new technology with the power-ups you get yeah, later in the game it's mm-hmm. like coming back to the first couple of levels once you have the light shoes and now you right. can <laughs> you can get to new areas of the map and you can beat things that you could not have done that's that's what it's like is that we didn't have you know, synch- synchrotron microscope technology a number of decades ago. Now we do. Right. So we can go back through everything that's already been studied and use this new technique on it where it's valid and can y- yield findings impossible when they were first discovered and maybe have been described multiple times already. Yeah. So these are this, it's very easy to view museum collections as the used up fossils right well it's like the warehouse in yeah. raiders of the lost ark no yeah. one goes there we just put stuff there yeah, well, well, that we're done right we're done with that the movie's over we did the <laughs> research we made the news announcement and now we put it in the box we put it in a drawer and we're done with it i wrote the paper right but that's not true at all and i wanted to i saw that right there at the end of the press release and i said this, this is a good time to point that out some of our listeners may have noticed that trend And yeah, that is coming from this shifting philosophy, if not in just realizing the importance of museum collections, but realizing the importance of mentioning the importance of museum collections. So if you keep your eyes out as you read about paleontology news, you'll, you'll notice this sentiment keeps popping up over and over again, as well it should. Absolutely. And to further that message, my next bit of news also is pulling from museum collections. Well, great. This is research on, once again, evolutionary patterns, but this time in mammals, also trying to answer how'd you get so crazy diverse from when you weren't. This research is by Anjali Goswami et al. in Science, and the article is by Sarah Whalen in Technology Networks. So, early mammals showed up during the time of the dinosaurs in the Mesozoic, and at that time they were not super diverse, not super large. You know, they were relatively small, with like dog size being about as big as they got, and I mean, they, there was more diversity than we often thought there was. You know, we've discovered over years. Right. But nowhere near what we see today. Still fairly low diversity. Then, into the Cretaceous, 
the asteroid hits. Episode 5. And mammals during the Cenozoic, that f- the following age that we are now in, diversify like crazy. And now mammals have extreme diversity. The paper noted that mammals have the greatest degree of morphological variation among vertebrate classes. Wow. Because you have things from whales to the bumblebee bat. Yeah, that and makes sense. <laughs> no other vertebrate group <laughs> matches that extreme form, you know, shape, as in yeah. the shape of their bodies is more diverse in mammals than any other vertebrate bony group. Yeah, at least living groups. Yes. <laughs> now, how did they evolve to that level of diversity is, once again, a very revisited question. Mm-hmm. And there are some discrepancies between the molecular, the genetic research and evidence, and how it compares to the fossil record, as we've discussed before, that those don't always agree, which has fueled debates about the timing, the tempo, as they put it, of the diversification and what the main drivers are. So this study was looking to try to help clear up the image of it. It's once again another 3D analysis, this time of skulls specifically, of both living and extinct placental mammals, they scanned 322 mammal skulls, which made this study an international collaboration over 20 museum collections. Wow, that's great. So, like, once again, this study was able to happen. Yeah. This is an amazing study that was able to happen because of a bunch of really awesome collections. And they were aiming to develop a new model of mammalian evolution, or at least placental mammalian evolution. Mm Mm-hmm. And they found a bunch of interesting stuff. One, the rate of evolution for mammals peaked right after the Cretaceous, the KPG boundary, extinction of the dinosaurs. Mammal evolution peaked. It took off. Right after that. They said within 100,000 years, some of the earliest ancestors of today's mammals had appeared. We know that from the fossil record. Mm -hmm. So like right within just thousands of years of that extinction, mammals were already diversifying like crazy. But that slowed very quickly. Okay. That diversification rate slowed shortly after and then was occasionally followed by smaller bursts of diversification that became less noticeable, less extreme over time. Over the last 66 million years, those bursts of diversification have become less and less notable. Huh. So we peaked, then slowed down really quick. Right. And then have had momentary bursts of diversification that have been getting less and less bursty. Interesting. I would imagine what it sounds like is when there's lots of uh, opportunities to evolve into new niches and environments, diversification, and then once those opportunities run out, you slow down. And as mammals have gotten more and more diverse over time, there's just less opportunity for that. Would be how what, the sort yeah. of my intuitive thought as to how why that would be the pattern. Makes sense to me. They noted that those bursts potentially could possibly be syncing up with climactic events. When sure. things get shaken up and there's opportunity for you to diversify again into big environmental shifts. Exactly. What they also found were some of the key factors that seem to speed up the evolution and diversification. Hmm. And they're interesting. These included things such as social behavior, diet, parental care, and time of activity, as well as habitat choice. Which okay. Which is a wide list of things. Sure. But the patterns they found were weird. Social pre kosher so if your babies are born, being able to run sooner than not. Right, like a zebra yep. as opposed to a bird. Yes. That, that's not a mammal, but you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> as opposed to us. As opposed to a human. So social, pre kosher aquatic, and herbivorous species. Not all those together, but those four groups all showed notably faster evolution. So faster rates of developing new features, diversifying into new species interesting they said especially whales elephants sirenians which include your manatees Mm -hmm. and extinct ungulates which are hoofed mammals Hmm. that those showed notably faster rates of evolution compared to other groups so like social mammals on average were evolving faster than solitary ones they noted even things like antlers and horns in ungulates which are social structures those are for social hierarchy and competition herbivores evolve faster than carnivores. Interesting. Yep. They think that they noted potentially that it they have to monitor plants and environments more closely than a carnivore does. So they are more closely tied to if the ecosystem changes. Yeah, that makes sense. Than a carnivore is. And precocial species are evolving faster than altricial species. So if you have lots of parental care, 
you're not evolving as quickly as one with less parental care. Yeah. So, like, horses and antelopes, as you said, are evolving faster than primates. Mm -hmm. Those those were all trends they noted in this study. Just overall patterns. Yep. And some groups have overall slower rates. Smaller mammals, like rodents and bats, seem to have a disassociation between taxonomic and morphological diversification, where the body shape and the number of species are not diversifying at the same rate. Gotcha. So if so even you, if you might species, have lots and lots of species, yep. but they all are shaped very much the same. Yeah, that they're not diversifying in the same ways. Right. <laughs> they also use this to try to attempt to reconstruct skull features of the earliest placental mammal ancestors. These would have been the ones living during the late Cretaceous, 100 to 66 million years ago. What they found was not super enlightening. They found that very likely the early ancestors of most placental mammal groups looked fairly similar. Which mm -hmm. makes sense. Makes That's sense. What we expect. Which makes it tricky for identifying individual early members. But they said it does give an indication to the slight differences that scientists must be expected to recognize. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that you're going to need to look for itty bitty details. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting because you said it's not super enlightening. It's not a super game changer in the sense of like, we didn't discover this hidden. Yeah, we didn't go. We're pretty sure it looks like this. There right. you go. But being able to say, hey, as we all expected, they all looked super similar back then. But these are the features that might be where we see the differences. Yeah, that can be a really key insight. Yes, it's, it's given us a, a, a potential guess as where to zoom in on. Yeah. I, all, the three newses we've talked about so far have all had this theme. This was totally unintentional. I mean, we <laughs> planned it. Have all had this theme of how particular factors that species are dealing with can contribute to long-term trends yeah. in evolutionary patterns. Which is really cool. We're not just studying how does this species adapt to this habitat. We're looking at how does this entire group change their evolutionary patterns as their environment or behavior or ancestry varies. That's really cool. Yeah, well, and I also like that this one was looking at ways of life. Like, I'd be fascinated to know, do any of those categories overlap with other animal groups? Right. right? Do, do, do you see the same trends in yeah. birds? Do you see the same trends in reptiles? Exactly. Are more social birds evolving more quickly than less social birds? Or is this just a mammal yeah. thing? Is it something about mammal social mammals that is specific? And it'd be fascinating to know if that was also true during the Mesozoic. Yes, exactly. Were Mesozoic mammals following the same trends? Oh, what sort? what cool stuff that we have to discover in the future. It's good. Well, for the last news, something... Completely different. <laughs> I've got news about glowing fossil scallops. All right, I'm ready. Kind of. <laughs> this is research in the journal Paleontology by Klaus Wolkenstein, and we will link in the blog post to a press release on phys.org via the University of Göttingen. We have mentioned many times before, especially in the news, that the chemistry of fossil remains is often studied with what is called ultraviolet light induced fluorescence which means you shine a uv light on the fossil and that light stimulates certain compounds in the fossil which then let off a glow yeah and then you can spot them it, different molecules and minerals react differently to the energy and give back a different wavelength right. which not only means you can spot where they are but what kind of glow they give off can tell you what materials you're looking at yeah. This has been used in many cases to look at color patterns in fossils that might be invisible to us or that might, ha that might not be obvious on the surface. This kind of study has been used to identify color patterns in fossil feathers and fossil skin remains, but also, and this was news to me, fossil seashells. Which makes total sense, but yeah, no, that never pinged my radar. Yeah, however, According to the researchers, this has most commonly been done in the Cenozoic era, the more recent time periods, less so earlier on in the Mesozoic. Here, they examine fluorescent color patterns in seashells from the Middle Triassic of Europe. So these are about 240 million years old, which is way older than most of the 
shells that have received similar studies. The shells in particular are uh, an ancient type called Pleuronectites, which are an er early members of a group called Pectinids, which are scallops. Which are delicious. Absolutely delicious. Also, I don't know. I didn't actually look at like the materials and methods and stuff. It sounded like they were looking at fossil shells from a variety of different locations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. possibly different locations across Europe. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that they did this using museum collections so that we continue <laughs> the trend, uh, which is probably true. But you know, go go read the paper to <laughs> confirm if that's true or not. <laughs> So they shine some UV light on a bunch of these shells to reveal fluorescent patterns of what were formerly the color patterns in these shells, which are no longer visible, but which have left evidence behind in the chemistry of the shell and found a whole variety of different patterns. As they described them, there were radial bands, there was striping, uh, zigzag and zigzag related patterns, <laughs> which is a great way to describe whatever that means. And something that the press release described as flame patterns, Ooh. Uh, which also sounds super cool. Yeah, it's for the roadster <laughs> that's, scallops. That's right. For the real fast ones. <laughs> uh, these, uh, there are pictures in the article, so check that out. The authors point out that today, scallops display a wide variety of different color patterns. But we didn't know that fossil scallops did. Yeah. We can see it in modern ones, but in fossil ones, the color is usually not still visible. Which which is often the case is we would have assumed very likely that they were displaying color. Sure. Because shelled things typically do. Right. But we couldn't know what it was or for sure that they were. Right. So this shows that they already had a diversity of color patterns all the way in the early members of the scallops group. Cool. But in addition to being informative about scallop appearance, it's also informative about the process of fossilization. Here's an important note. These fossil scallops, their color patterns were fluorescent. They glowed under UV. Modern scallops don't fluoresce. They don't have fluorescent color patterns. And probably neither did these. They're fluorescing because of what fossilization has done to the fossils. Chemical analysis of the fossils found that the compounds that are actually releasing, that are reacting with the UV, that are releasing the glow, are certain organic compounds in the shells, which are not the pigment molecules. They're not the things that, the, the molecules that produced the color originally. They are the remnants of the pigment molecules that have been broken down by the chemical processes of fossilization. If you did the same test on a modern scallop, it wouldn't glow. It only works on the molecules that have been sitting in the ground being fossilized for millions of years. Yeah. What's glowing is the breakdown products of that chemical process. Yeah. Specifically, they, they said oxidized compounds. All right. Yeah. That is what has changed about them. Well, it, I, that's it's such an interesting note that immediately makes sense as soon as you consider that. If you if you bury an organism and then chemicals start to mm -hmm. interact with that organism, but the organism is not made all of one thing. It's made right. out of differing chemicals and molecules throughout its body. Yeah. The pigment is a different molecule than the non-pigmented area. Yes. So the chemical reaction is going to be slightly different as it interacts with these different things. It's yep. like if you use a cleaner on different surfaces in your kitchen, <laughs> it's going to react differently to the different surfaces. Yes. The pigments originally, a pigment molecule, it has a color, but the pigments, at least in scallops, don't fluoresce. What's left after the breakdown are compounds that don't have a color, which is why we can't see them, but do fluoresce. Yeah. And they noted that not only did the patterns of color, because this is still where the color was, the patterns vary, but so does the fluorescence. Okay. The intensity, how intensely it glows, from intense to not at all. And the color of the fluorescence, from yellow to red and everything in between, varied depending on where the fossils were found, depending on oh. what deposit they came from, which suggests that they were fossilizing slightly differently in different deposits, and that different fossilization process changed what the breakdown products were left behind, which means that they don't all fluoresce the same. So it's not that we're getting different intensities and colors of fluorescence due to the 
darkness or lightness of the color on the scallop or the color that the scallop was, Mm -hmm. but because of where it was fossilizing and what was fossilizing it. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. (laughs) And that is one of the key points, the key takeaways that they come out of this with is saying the diversity we're seeing in the patterns seems to reflect the original color patterns, but the different manners of fluorescence are not necessarily to do with features of the scallops originally. Yes. That you shouldn't be using fluorescence color, for example, to identify different species. Yes. Or to interpret different types of color. That seems to be mostly about how they're fossilizing. Yeah, that if the same species had occupied all of the site, these different sites. And these, it does seem like they were looking at all the same... I think it was all the same species. It was oh. definitely all the same genus. Yes, that makes sense. But like you could have the same, like a, a single population, if you spread them out across all those sites way back when, allowed them to fossilize, they'd come back glowing different colors. Right. Even if they looked the same otherwise yes. originally. That, yeah, if you had that is spread something... them and spread them out. <laughs> that is something that fossilization did to them. <sighs> so just like when we get a, dinosaur skull and it's all squished and we put it together and it's it's got like a little bit of a slant to it we go all right that's not a feature of this species yep. that happened during fossilization the glowing is the same thing well, that happened during fossilization this is just another beautiful example of the detective work that goes into paleontology where you go all right we've discovered something new like great cool now how many of these features are due to what right which of these are fossilization features which of these are animal features or organism features you know which of these are due to what living thing we found and which of these are due to what happened right. to it to where we found it yes that it's it's like we were saying with evolution fossilization is <laughs> like the layers of complexity mm-hmm. can get really intense episode 137 <sighs> for more on that that's so cool and hey speaking of Big deal evolutionary trends and rich fossil deposits and exceptional patterns of fossilization. All those things are themes that tie into our main episode topic. Ah, we planned it along. Just like we planned for these authors to publish these scientific papers (laughs) this month so that we could tie it into our Jehol Biota episode. That's what we were doing while we were busy all last (laughs) week. We were were bribing bribing scientists, so you better publish that. We're bribing and and putting holds. (laughs) Why is it taking so long for this to get published? That's right. We're like, no, no. Listen here, nature. You hold up. (laughs) You... To the beat of our drum. <laughs> After the break, we will get into our main topic, the Jehol Biota. We will start by talking about what it is. Some of you out there might be going, I don't. What are you talking about? Yep. I don't know what these words mean. We're going to tell you what these words mean. Stay tuned. The Jehol Biota is a series of fossil assemblages from the early Cretaceous period of northeastern China, and we have mentioned it dozens of times on the podcast because we do a paleontology podcast. And in this day and age, you cannot do a paleontology podcast without regularly bringing up fossils from the Jehol Biota. We haven't always said the words Jehol Biota. Yes. Because sometimes we refer to more specific areas where they come from, or sometimes we're just talking about that one cool fossil. Yeah, or just that species. But we have mentioned fossils from this place because this is one of the most productive fossil localities in the world and has produced some of the world's most incredible and unique fossil finds. The Jehol Biota includes fossils of dinosaurs, plants, mammals, insects, all sorts of early Cretaceous ecosystem members. And often, very complete, very well-preserved fossil remains. The fossils of the Jehol Biota include dinosaurs, dinosaurs, so many dinosaurs, (laughs) pterosaurs, mammals, insects, plants, uh, other reptiles, amphibians, all sorts of stuff, representing a really detailed look at this ecosystem of the past. Now, I want to just take a moment and talk about the terms that we're using here. We've done episodes on fossil sites before. So we've done, we did episode 14 was the gray fossil site, which is a fossil site. 
Yes. A, a single deposit with the remains of an ancient habitat. It has one mailing address. One mailing yes, address. Right there behind the museum. We did episode 127 was the Hell Creek Formation. That is an entire geologic formation that stretches across a swath of the United States that represents a series of ecosystems, habitats uh, in the past. This episode, we are talking about a biota, and that's a little bit different. We've done a biota episode before, episode 31. Way back. The Ediacaran biota. Biota is not referring to the fossil sites or the formations, but to the fossils themselves, the animals and plants, the life. The assemblage. Yes. Biota. That bio, that's the life. Yes. The Ediacaran biota refers to all the life from a particular slice of time on Earth just before the Cambrian explosion. The Jehol biota refers to the life preserved as fossils in this one particular region from this one particular time. And that's important to point out because what we're discussing, sort of the def- the definition here is the fossils. Yeah. The actual, it's not just a place, it's the ecosystem that was there. It's not the J-hole fossil site. Right. Although, stay tuned. <laughs> now, what actually counts as being part of the J-hole biota is a little bit hazy. Mm-hmm. More on that later. But generally speaking, most scientists agree that it includes three major geologic formations. Cool. The Jufotang, Yixian, and Huajiying formations, which are found in northeastern China, in Liaoning and Hebei provinces, and Inner Mongolia. This little chunk of northeastern China. Again, the biota is the fossils from those places. From youngest to oldest, these geologic formations cover the period of roughly 135 million to 110 million years ago. Okay. Early Cretaceous, after Stegosaurus, before T-Rex, right there in the the staging period of the Cretaceous. These formations, plus some of the nearby very similar formations, the fossils there, and also maybe some other fossils from some other fossil sites. Again, stay tuned (laughs) for that. The fossil assemblages from these formations are super famous for a few reasons. For one, there are tons of fossils. Tons of fossils have been found, tons of ancient species. It is reportedly the most diverse fossil region from that time period anywhere in the world. Yeah. Also, the Jehol Biota is famous for its exceptional fossil preservation. We have used the term Konservat Lagerstätten before, a fossil site that just preserves the most beautiful fossils you've ever seen. Many of the fossils of the Jehol Biota are complete or nearly complete specimens, full skeletons, full bodies. They often preserved soft tissues and microstructures, including skin and scales, uh, impressions that show us like scale patterns and such, hair and feathers, insect bristles and the details of the wings, all sorts of really detailed preservation, as well as famously things like stomach content, eggs and embryos, pigmentation and signs of colors on the fossils all sort you name an exceptional kind of fossil it has probably been found among the jehol biota and all of this these claims to fame make the jehol biota extremely valuable for studying the origins and evolutions and trends of major groups of life through time So it's a very exciting region for people who want to study fossils, for people who want to collect fossils, and for people who just want to admire fossils. Because they're pretty. (laughs) This is a really exceptional region. Now, later on in the discussion, we'll go into more detail about exactly what has been found there and what sort of studies have been done there. But just to sort of whet our appetites and get us started, here is a short list of famous fossil finds that you might have heard about from the Jehol Biota. Uh, who's who of Jehol? A, a, a little bit of a who's who. Uh, Sinoceropteryx in the 1990s became the first ever known non-bird feathered dinosaur. Right, that was, wasn't it? That's Jehol. Microraptor. Yeah. The four-winged gliding dinosaur covered in feathers with signs of pigmentation that is one of the only non-bird dinosaurs we know of with apparent partial flight capability. Psittacosaurus, the early relative of the horned dinosaurs, Triceratops and stuff, specifically that one specimen 
that was preserved with the bristles and the signs of its color and scale patterns and its cloaca. Yeah. That one, Jehobiota. <laughs> Arche fructus, possibly the oldest known flowering plant. Right. Jehobiota. Uh, back in episode 148, we mentioned Xianglong, the oldest known gliding lizard. That was from here. A mammal called Rapenomamus, not only an unusually large Mesozoic mammal, but also the first ever mammal discovered with dinosaurs in its belly. Right, okay, now I remember that one. The first ever discovered pterosaur eggs. <laughs> and tons of other birds and feathered dinosaurs and all sorts of other stuff. Like I said, we'll go into more detail later, but just to get across, this is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Fossil deposit. Also, most of those famous discoveries were made in the last two or three decades. Yeah. Well, and that that's the thing that is so special about the J-hole bio- biota to me is that it it it's happening now. Like this is mm-hmm. this is really we're living in the period that paleontolo- paleontological historians and history you know discussions will be looking back on when the J-hole biota what's happening Mm -hmm. which is cool that's awesome to be living through and and be living during these discoveries that have fully reshaped how we interpret many groups of dinosaurs and many aspects of dinosaur like big huge changes in our understandings because of this site and it's and it's still happening like yeah that's this is a big deal place that is still being like currently it's a a big deal right now yes this is you know like (laughs) Plenty of other fossil sites are big deals, but many of them are now, oh, how do I want to say this, in historical perspective, where they have been a big right. deal, but that happened a long time ago. So right, now and maybe, it's, maybe it's slowed down yeah. now, or sometimes we it's stopped. Yes, exactly. And we, we have stopped doing work on them. This one is, we are currently in the, the age the, the, of the discovery. The golden age. Yes. Yep. Now, it's interesting because we are absolutely at the time where most of these big discoveries are being made. But the history of the Jehol Biota and the sites included within it go back quite a while. Within the papers that I read, that I found a bunch of cool review papers about studies on the Jehol Biota, the earliest mention that I found for study on these fossil sites were reports of fish fossils collected and identified in the mid to late 1800s, so well over a century ago. At first, these fish were incorrectly identified as fish from the Cenozoic, so much more recent fish, and then later correctly identified as a relatively famous Mesozoic fish called Lycoptera. Oh, hey! In 1923, so a hundred years ago, American paleontologist A.W. Grabau first used the term Jehol Ceres to describe a set of lake deposits in the Jehol province. That's where this word comes from. Jehol is the name of the area. Also, Ediacaran biota is named after the location where it was first described. Yes. So Grabau called these deposits the Jehol series and used the term Jehol fauna for the fossil animals found within. As time went on, more fossil deposits were found with more fossils in them. So in the 1960s, Chinese paleontologist Gu Jiwei updated the terms to Jehol Group for a bunch more fossil deposits, not just lake deposits, but lake and volcanic deposits, and first used the term Jehol Biota for all the plants and animals, all the fossils from these areas. By that time period, the biota included plenty of invertebrates, fish, various reptiles, including dinosaurs, and was starting to look like a relatively diverse assemblage of fossils. In the early days, there were a number of debates about the identity of the Jehol biota. For one, early scientists disagreed on how old it was. Some suggested mid to late Jurassic, others suggested early Cretaceous. As time went on and we got not only better dating methods, but also better studies doing dating on the sites, scientists were able to correctly identify it as early Cretaceous. Another debate over time has been how to define what counts as the Jehol Biota. If you find another lake deposit, how do you know if that's part of the same ecosystem assemblage that we're talking about? The original definition was based on the presence of three fossils. Oh. Lycoptera, that fish I mentioned, 
Ephemeropsis, an ancient cousin of mayflies, an insect, and Eocestheria, a type of ancient bivalve. Okay. Those were the three. If you have those three, you're looking at the Jahol biota. But as time went on and more sites were examined and more fossils were found, researchers discovered that these fossils were not actually consistently present. Like, you'd get a site where you'd be like, that, this is totally the Jahol biota, but it is missing one of those. Yeah. So later on, some considered changing the definition that it's not just if you have those fossils, it's if you have anything that coexisted with those fossils. Okay. So if you find those with something else over here, and then you find that thing in this other site, that still counts. Maybe that's how we sort of try to define it. But that also hasn't worked perfectly. That didn't make everybody happy. So there continued to be this sort of back and forth on how do we actually classify what counts Mm -hmm. under this umbrella term. Then things took a dramatic change in the 1990s when there was, as one article I read put it, a research bloom. (laughs) The discoveries of a bunch of new bird and dinosaur fossils, including lots of feathered bird and dinosaur specimens, created a sudden, not only a rush of new discoveries and research on the Jahol biota, but also a whole bunch more attention. Yeah. Scientists around the world started to realize the potential of this area and what these discoveries meant, and that it this was worthy of much more investigation and research. By the 2000s, the Jahol biota had become a world-famous major focus of paleontology research. This meant a few things. One, lots more research, lots more attention, lots more discovery, lots more of Jahol discoveries making it into the news. Cynoceropteryx and Microraptor and all those cool fossils start coming into the scientific literature. It also meant that it has became even more important to nail down what counts as the Jahol biota yeah. as we keep finding more stuff. And since those early definitions were really focused on what fossils are found there and it wasn't quite working, later attempts at defining it tried to incorporate the geology of those. Not just what we're finding here, but what is the nature of the actual deposits. This is often how fossil formations like the Hell Creek Formation, like the Burgess Shale, are defined as a combination of what fossils are found there, but also what is the geology. Yeah, are you found in the same kind of rock? Right, exactly. Now, fortunately, the geology, the the physical nature of the Jehol Biota deposits, is well documented. I read a number of different papers that agreed that the Jehol Biota includes mainly two types of deposits. The first type are finely layered shales and mudstones. These are very fine-grained rocks fine layers of shale and mudstone, and in between them, layers of ash from volcanic activity in the area. These types of deposits often have extremely well-preserved, finely preserved fossils pressed nicely into those ash and mudstone layers. So when you think about your microraptor that's just sort of pressed like a leaf between the layers of the sediment with its feathers spread out, that kind of preservation is very common in these types of deposits. Yeah, these flattened specimens, but nicely laid out as they laid down. Right. With impressions of skin mm-hmm. and feather and stuff. The other type of deposit are what are I've, I've seen called ashy sandstones, hmm. which also often have full skeletons, articulated skeletons in position in their original shape, but rarely with soft tissues preserved. All right. So you get nice whole skeletons, but you're not getting the feather impressions and stuff. But both types of deposits are doing a really good job preserving good good specimens. As always, the geologic features of deposits are related to what the environment was at the time. These deposits are the remnant of a landscape in this region of lakes and volcanic activity. Lots of lakes with volcanic Uh, ash being laid down between and within the beds. This landscape is associated with the breakup of parts of northern China, of that section of Asia. There was a lot of continental rifting, and that rift that creates basins which fill up with lakes. Rifting is also associated with volcanic activity. 
Uh, back to our plate tectonics episode, episode 122. This landscape would have been home to all of these animals that left behind their fossils in the area. The lakes, excellent for collecting fossils. And the lake set of the lake muds and the volcanic ash were really good, gentle, fine sediments for preserving really well-preserved fossils. Yes. Also, there's been plenty of discussion that I've seen in the literature about how the volcanic activity might also have contributed to the fossil record here by creating dangerous conditions that led to deaths of fossil organisms. Oh, uh, yeah. That not necessarily burning them and burying them in ash, although sometimes those ashy sandstones are often interpreted as lahar deposits. Yeah. But also create, you know, releasing gases, creating oxygen-poor conditions within the water that can all lead to not only the deaths of organisms and thus the first step of fossilization, but conditions where scavengers and decomposers might not fare very well, so things are left alone to fossilize better. Yeah, no, it makes sense because you've got habitats where fossilization is very common. You know, lakes mm-hmm. are very, very well known for fossilization because you've got often not fast-moving water, at least, with sediments that can bury in a very seasonal nature. That's great. Find silty sediments, great for high detail, mm-hmm. and then volcanic activity to help kill stuff. <laughs> like, right. That's, and that's, contribute that's, ash, which is more fine yeah. detail. Like, that. Pretty <laughs> ideal scenario. Also, ash is really great for dating. Yes. For radiometric dating. Good so point. it's just a great condition for a fossil locality. Well, I feel like this is one of the, the, the times to respond because, you know, I've had people ask and I've definitely seen the statement come up when we talk about the, the troubles of fossilization, you know, mm-hmm. and how rare it can be and how much it can, you know, mess up a specimen you know, where things can be damaged or only partially fossilized and what data can be lost, that we're often fighting against the very process that gives us the fossils. Right. That I've definitely come across the sentiment of like, yeah, but surely it has to just go right sometimes. Like, right. <laughs> like if if it is, it, you're talking about the statistics of it, that over the millions of years, over the millions of individuals, over the millions of species, typically things are going to go kind of rough just because... That's the odds. It's not likely they're going to fossilize to begin with. So when they do, it's not likely that they fossilize perfectly. Right. But surely that means there are times where they do fossilize, where the situation is pretty much ideal. And yeah, we do have fossil sites where it's like, I don't really have any complaints about what you're doing there, (laughs) J-Hole. Like... This is a pretty great situation. Yeah. You've got the right geology, the right environment, a diverse ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So sometimes things do align in the most ideal way. Mm-hmm. And since the geology of the region is so tied into what makes this such an exceptional series of fossil localities, it makes sense that researchers have tried to incorporate the geology, the features of the deposits, into defining the Jahol biota and the Jahol group, the, the deposits that produce the Jahol biota fossils well it's you'll you'll hear similar discussions when lagerstatten are discussed where that is a site that preserves fossils particularly well but as often as you'll hear that discussed i'll see the types of sediment at lagerstatten's are very typically a similar type of deposit because that's how you get really nice fossils so more modern definitions of jahol biota incorporate the fossils and the geology uh there doesn't seem to be A definition. Still to this day, there does not seem to be a consensus on this is the official description. But there is one definition, one suggested definition, that I saw show up in a couple, in a handful of different papers that I read that I'll recite here. This was proposed by Pan et al. in 2013. They defined the Jahol biota as the organisms that lived in the early Cretaceous volcanic-influenced environments of northeastern China and were buried in lacustrine, that means lakes, and rarely fluvial, that means rivers, sediments, where most turned into exceptionally preserved fossils. Yeah. It's a definition that is, we're talking about the organisms, but also the deposits that they're in, and also including a note on the style of preservation. Yes. That this this term is referring to 
these really, really nicely preserved fossils. Yes. And that's really key. And, and that drives home the point that I made earlier. We're not talking about a fossil site. And we're not talking about even an individual ecosystem. Mm-hmm. This is a series of, e- of ecosystems across tens of millions of years over an area of what is now northeastern China that all share these defining features of not only what organisms are preserved there, but how they're preserved. The papers that I've seen that use that definition uh, like it in part because that ends up including those big three formations I mentioned, Yixian, Jiufotang, and Huajiying, which are in the Liaoning province, the Hebei province, and Inner Mongolia, plus some similar nearby deposits. This is sort of the everyone agrees these are the Jehol Biota formations, even if they disagree on the fact that there are other similar deposits elsewhere, mm-hmm. uh, other parts of China, but also not in China, uh, in nearby places, including Korea, Japan, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and Siberia, which in many cases seem to be very similar, it sounds like, to the Jehol Biota but which not every definition includes them. So there's still, there's this core Jahal Biota, and then there's these blurry outlines of some maybes. Maybe this site counts, maybe this site doesn't count. As, as is so often the case when we are putting things in boxes. We're putting things in boxes. Like, we almost always have things that perfectly fit what we have made the box for. Absolutely, like, that's right in the center of the box. Yeah, that's obviously these go in we, this box. We put the box around that. Yeah, this is why we made this <laughs> box. <laughs> this is why we decided we needed a box here. But then as you move to the edges, things are going to get blurry. Because, yeah, no, it's all of the features we've described for what makes these deposits the way they are and the fossils the way they are can all be tweaked by degrees like if you're if your water's slightly less stagnant you know if it's not as still Mm -hmm. that's going to change things if your sediment is not quite as fine if your volcanic activity is not quite as regular and those are going to vary not only as you get farther in space right geographically from the quintessential examples, but also farther in time. Yeah, exactly. It's going to change over during the years. You're going to have volcanic activity waning, ebbing and waning and changing, mm-hmm. and your lakes are going to eventually come and go. Right. And your environment's going to change. Yes. Just, just what the habitat is, is going to shift. So it is not a surprise that there is a haziness to the definition, but whatever definition we want to use, Most researchers agree, all right, at the very least, these big deal formations, this general time frame, this area, these are the fossils we're talking about when we talk about the Jehol biota. And they have a ton in common in terms of their ecosystem structure, in terms of their time period, in terms of their habitat. One of the more recent papers that I actually read was Shing et al. 2020 had a whole section talking about this sort of historical difficulty with how exactly where do we draw the lines and at the end of all that discussion they said basically what we we've just been saying that we're trying to put a box around so many different variable factors that as they put it any definition is destined to be artificial yes absolutely there's always going to be a bit of a haziness but as long as we generally know what we're talking about the jehol biota is this series of really cool fossil sites Well, and as we've said with other topics that struggle to be, you know, that resist being put in a box, as all topics do, but some more so than others, as long as we acknowledge that Mm -hmm. when we discuss it, as long as we say, all right, we're discussing the J-hole biota, so these core sites, we are deciding to include these sites out of the ones around the edge, but we're not going to include these for these reasons. Perfectly valid study. Right. As long as you are aware and you, for your study, define, we are going to consider this, but not this, as part of the biota, because for our interpretations of the definition, we don't feel those fall in enough to be included right now. Cool. As long as you make that clear, science is solid. It's when we argue over term as if we can form some perfect golden definition. Mm -hmm. As long as we are agreeing that our term is flawed... That doesn't actually make using it difficult. Right. We just have to be honest about it. 
So the various formations and deposits that we include when we're talking about the Jehol biota share a lot when it comes to what kinds of sediments they're preserved in, how well the fossils are preserved, what that habitat was, lakes and volcanoes, rift valleys, and, of course, the life, the fossils themselves that are left behind tend to be very consistent across these areas. So, after the break, we will finally start talking in detail about the biota of the Jahol biota. (laughs) Stay tuned. As we've established, the Jahol biota is an ecosystem from the early Cretaceous of northeastern China. Here is what is in that ecosystem. (laughs) First, plants. Lots of plants. Mostly gymnosperms, so including cycads, conifers. Also algae, lichens, ferns, and some early angiosperms, flowering plants. Now, I did find a study that actually listed numbers of how many species of various things. Uh, That was from, I believe, 2010. Oh, yeah. So my, these numbers are liable to just become increasingly out of date. As I say, like that, a, a decade of... As a decade, yeah. These so. findings, that's probably way out of date. <laughs> but that study said over 50 species of plants. So imagine how many there are now. Right. So lots of plants, invertebrates, including gastropods, which are snails and slugs, bivalves, crustaceans, spiders, and lots of insects. Hundreds of species of insects have been identified within the Jehol biota, preserved in sediment. We've talked in the past about ways that insects do or don't preserve really well, and so often, really well-preserved insect remains are in amber. Yes. The, that tree resin that hardens around the bug and traps it in there. These deposits are sediment deposits. Hundreds of species of insects have been identified here often with really finely preserved structures. Like I said, the bristles and the mouth parts and wing membranes and stuff like that. And of course, the superstars, at least the ones that make a lot of the headlines, are vertebrates. According to that old, old paper, more than 140 species of vertebrate animals have been identified, including lots of fish. The first thing ever described from these deposits was fish. These include jawless fish, Bony fish, cartilaginous fish. These also include Mesomyzon, the oldest known freshwater lamprey. Oh, cool. Which I believe we mentioned yeah. on the podcast, on some news, I think. There are amphibians, including both frogs and salamanders, including some early members of key salamander groups. Plenty of mammals, including extinct groups like multi-tuberculates, and early members of metatherians, which is the group that includes marsupials, and eutherians, which is the group that includes placentals, so most living mammals. Many mammals, of course, are known from very complete skeletons, and often with fur preserved, pressed into the sediment around them. Yeah. Tons of reptiles. There are turtles. There are lizards. There are charistodires, which is another group of ancient reptiles that were sometimes lizard-like, sometimes croc-like. Interestingly enough, as far as I can tell from what I've read, there are no crocs yeah. or snakes in the Jahol biota. Weird. Yeah. Which is a real oversight, I think. Yeah. I don't I don't know a ton about croc history in the China region in general. Like I don't know a lot about the history there, so I don't know how robust the history is there. Mm-hmm. Like today there's on, there's not a huge right. diversity. In that region of the world, there's only the Chinese alligator within China, I believe. I don't think any other crocs. So I don't know what the history... I don't know how weird it is that they're lacking from there. Seems weird to me. Yeah. Snakes definitely seems weird. There are lizards. There's true lizards out there. So I don't know what's going on. That's that's definitely odd. (laughs) There are lots of pterosaurs, the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic, including early members of many important Cretaceous groups often preserved, again, with their wing membranes alongside the body, things like that. Which is one of those, like, like the insects, that that's saying something. Yes. Getting nice pterosaurs, getting nice pipe cleaner animals. <laughs> yeah. 
and of course, dinosaurs. Lots of different dinosaurs, more than 30 species, again, probably an outdated number, of non-bird dinosaurs, including both Ornithischians and Saurischians, with lots of especially well-preserved small theropods. Small, bipedal, mostly carnivores, things like Microraptor, stuff like that. There are also some big ones like Euteranus. Lots of these are preserved with soft tissue structures and, very famously, with feathers. Yeah, I, for me, I definitely think of, first, the small theropods when I think of yes. J-Hole. Like that, that's what that term brings to mind for me, is tiny little two-legged predatory dinosaurs covered in feathers. Th- those words are synonymous. <laughs> like th- those two terms, those two concepts are connected in my brain. Right. Because it's it's just so many of the ones that we now know and that have reshaped that image of the small bird-ish little dinosaurs has come from this site. Yep. And not only the small bird-ish theropods, but the small birds. Yeah. Even more than there are species of non-bird dinosaurs, there are, again, according to my probably slightly out of date thing, more species of birds. Over 40 species, according to that one reference, including many different groups, early members, early stages of bird evolution, birds and dinosaurs, birds and other dinosaurs are probably the biggest factor in putting the Jehol biota sort of on the map, or at least in the news headlines. Though those are really stars of this deposit. Yeah. Which makes sense, because one, dinosaurs are charismatic. Sure. Like, if you have nice dinosaur fossils, we're going to talk about you. That's just the world we live in. Thank goodness. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also, like, these are small feather dinosaurs, and small animals don't always fossilize super well. Right, because so they're, they're delicate. Rare. Yep. But then birds, much like pterosaurs, much like insects, often don't fossilize well because they are delicate by comparison. Yeah, and they tend to be small. Yes, so they have a lot working against them to preserve. So finding a site where they are, that is particularly good at preserving yeah. them, like this is a this is a bird site that is really well known for birds. A big deal. And th- this is a site that is really well known like specialized almost in a in its very passive natural way <laughs> in birds pterosaurs and insects yeah all which makes total sense they are very abundant very diverse groups so if you have a fossil locality that can preserve them well then of course you're going to get tons and tons of them which all, i feel also is a really great lesson in demonstrating what we mean when we say they don't fossilize well where it's like if they were being fossilized you know, properly, so to speak, you know, quote unquote, properly, <laughs> if other fossil sites were pulling their weight. Right. Th- this is what you should be. They should be everywhere. They should be all over the place. Because these things fill the skies. That's what they do. Yes. <laughs> Birds and insects. And as our knowledge goes for pterosaurs, th- things that fly just fill the skies. So we should have bucket loads. Yeah. But the fact that we don't is telling about the fossilization process. Here we get a rare glimpse. Yes. So cool. So we have a diverse group of different types, different different groups of organisms. Also, it's ecologically very diverse. There's herbivores and predators, of course, but there's also filter feeders. There's a bunch of parasites, particularly among the insects. There are some very large predators. There are a number that have been pointed at as the top predators of the Jehol biota. Cool. Including the big Charistodire Echecosaurus and the dinosaurs Euteranus and Cenotyrannus. These fossils also give us a good indication of what the habitat was, not just lakes and volcanoes, but forested area, lakes surrounded by forest. And we know forest not only because we've got a bunch of plants, but the ecosystem is typical forest-type organisms. Lots of the animals are herbivorous, including the majority of the insects are leaf eaters. Makes sense. And there's a surprising abundance of climbing animals yeah tree dwellers including birds including other small dinosaurs pterosaurs lizards there's at least one lizard that has been suggested to possibly be a climber and there's the gliding lizard that we talked about back in the gliding episode and gliders tend to live in forested areas where there's stuff to glide around we're seeing animals which would do well in a vertical environment yes 
Also, the forested habitat has been corroborated, as you may recall when we talked about this in the news at some point, by that one famous Psittacosaurus specimen with color patterns that has a color pattern that is more similar to forest dwellers than to open habitat dwellers. That, that is countershaded in that way. <laughs> Which is, that's, wow. Like, yeah, I, I, I will never stop being <laughs> at low level freak out over how cool studies like that are so cool go look back at whatever episode that was when we talked about that <laughs> uh there are uh, there have been reports that a number of the insects are groups that we would expect to find at high altitudes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like mountain dwellers so it suggests there were some relatively high altitude areas within these regions the climatic conditions it seems like there has been some variable evidence for what the climate was a number of plant research and isotope data, so chemical studies on the fossils, suggest cooler climates for parts of the Jehol biota. Sometimes I, I, one study referred to cool, perhaps even cold. Okay. Uh, which is a bit unusual since the Mesozoic was generally a warm time. Yeah. But then some other studies, some other plant research, it sounds like at least, has suggested warm or even hot conditions. And this could be explained by just you know, we have to do more research. Mm -hmm. It could be that there were a variety of climate conditions over time. Yep. And a variety of habitats. We might be looking at valleys and mountains. Yes. And we might be looking at a swath of time that covered cool and warm time periods. One study that I did, just to do a little callback to, you know, several minutes ago. One study I read did suggest that if there were cooler climates at this time in this place, that could be a reason not only why we see so much evidence of feathers here, like mm. feathery dinosaurs. Now, uh, we do have to sp specify most fossil deposits are not fossilized the right way to capture feathers. Yes. So that that's not a 100% correlation. Well, yeah, the, the fact that we're finding more feathers here might not be that you needed feathers here, just that they're preserving here. Right. They might have been just as common everywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> but if they weren't, could be a climate thing. And that same study said maybe that's why there's no crocodiliforms. It's a very good point. <laughs> because today crocs are very restricted based on climate zones. Well, absolutely. that's definitely why there's not a ton of crocs in a in, lot of... In, there's no crocs in northeast China yeah, today. because... Mm -hmm. And the only one that makes it up into China is an alligator, which are very good at cold weather. Yes. It's... China is not super friendly to crocs. <laughs> <laughs> now, that being said, it sounds like there's still a lot of work to be done sorting out the specifics of the climate of the Jehol biota. So none of that is a definitive statement. Yeah, you know, we could c c discover a croc tomorrow. Yeah. They might have discovered a croc yesterday. <laughs> yes. I, the research is ongoing. I would love if anyone out there listening is a researcher, has more knowledge and can like give us the numbers that have been updated. Or something, that would be so cool. Yeah. I would love for them to come back and be like, Oh, honey. Dub double like, all those numbers. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Here's the 17 snakes we've discovered. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Another interesting note about the biota itself. Many of these fossils, it has been noted, are endemic to Jehol. Interesting. To this region, meaning they're not found anywhere else. And a lot of them are early members of important lineages early members of certain groups of birds and mammals and pterosaurs and insects, which those two things together have led some researchers to suggest that the Jehol region might have been a center of diversification yes. and origination. That it could be that this just happens to be the area where we're capturing a portion of the diversity at that time. Yeah, like you mentioned that this is the best collection of life from this time period right. which means we are getting a way skewed perspective yeah, they just may not have been fossilizing everywhere else but it could also be that this is where those groups were getting their start this is like the the fertile crescent right. first, first this was a this... cauldron where we were cooking up new forms of life yeah right <laughs> <laughs> another thing is that a lot of studies have noted uh, what they refer to as the three phases of the Jehol biota, Ooh. which roughly correspond to three the three main formations, that as time went on, there was an early, middle, and late phase where the ecosystem and the distributions of various groups shifted with each phase. And this has apparently been noted in insects, other invertebrates, birds, fish, pterosaurs, and others, that there seems to be this signal that 
a couple times, the Jahal Biota changed a bunch. Yeah. Now, this is still being studied, as with so many of the things that characterize the Jahal Biota. This is still under investigation. I've seen some mention that some researchers have possibly disagreed with this characterization. It wouldn't surprise me at all if further research is done and it turns out that that was an oversimplification, that it's more of a spectrum, or that there's nine phases or something that, you know, more research is continuing. Yes. But you'll often hear discussion of the early, middle, late phase of evolution of this ecosystem. Yeah. Well, it's, it's once again, since we're in the midst of this, this, this renaissance of discoveries that's happening in this area, there's a bunch of things that are going to take time to establish. But like, Mm -hmm. even if we take a closer look and realize, oh, not really, there's definitely something there right now that seems to be indicating. So we need to figure out Right. What? Why are we getting these signals? What's the deal? Are these signals actually an evolutionary shift or a, a, a environmental shift? Or is something giving us that signal and now we need to be aware of what's giving us? So like, yeah, yeah. it's one of those fun situations of it's, we still need to be aware of that beginning, middle and end, even if it's not for the reason we might currently be considering it. There's still something there that made us want to give those titles. Right. Oh, cool. I like you use the word renaissance, um, which I, brings me to a really good point that I didn't think to make before, but I'm going to make it now. Um, we've talked about the time period called the dinosaur renaissance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, during the 60s, 70s, 80s, major overhaul, lots of new discoveries and so on. It has often been pointed out that we are currently in another what, what I've seen called the dinosaur revolution. Yes. Not just with dinosaurs, but with paleontology in general. We are in a age of peak discovery in the field of paleontology, particularly dinosaurs and vertebrate paleontology. And often when you hear that described, and often when I describe it, that it is characterized by new techniques, new discoveries, new areas to be explored, one of the things that is often said, including by me, is among those discoveries are a bunch of cool new fossil sites over in China. Yes. These are those fossil sites. This is what we're (laughs) referencing when we say that. This is what we're talking about when we say, yeah, a whole new age of research in paleontology. Yeah, this, this is, this area is one of the main focuses of that. Well, it's, it, so much of the discoveries from J-Hole has reshaped the way we discuss things now. And it's not wholly on this site. You know, there Mm -hmm. are other sites where we have found feathered dinosaurs, but this is definitely one of the sites that, in my mind, sparked some of the earliest of those big popular, you know, that made a splash on the, the popular new scene to get people to start discussing fuzzy dinosaurs. Like the, the feathered dinosaur discussion in many ways starts here. Exactly. This so is like, where the first feathered mm-hmm. dinosaur that wasn't a bird was discovered. So like... It's, this is not the only reason we're discussing it. We found feathered dinosaurs from other sites now. Yeah. But this is this is harkening back to the beginning of that discussion. And if there's not a feature of popular dinosaur discussion that is one of the <laughs> most forefront today, it is feathered dinosaurs. That that is a wholly new way to interpret this popular group of animals. This is one of the sites that is why we're having that conversation. This is why people are debating the Jurassic World movies. Yes. <laughs> in regards to that. That's the Jahol Biota. Yes. That's, <laughs> it is a paradigm shift for the popular discussion almost sparked solely by this area. Right. That's insane. And that uh, segues very nicely into what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this discussion is the research done on the fossils from the Jahol Biota. Yes. Uh, we do not have anywhere near the time <laughs> to just go and talk about all the different research. There's tons of it. So instead, I'm going to point out some major topics of research that the Jahol Biota features prominently within, and we'll discuss those a little bit. And since we were just talking about it, let's start with integument. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, there are plenty of fossils with furry mammals and the membranes and tissues on pterosaurs and the bristles on insects, but feathered dinosaurs are the thing that you often think of when you think of the Jahol Biota, as we were just discussing. Yeah, if you put it into a Google image search, those are going to be almost certainly <laughs> the first images that come back. The Jahol Biota has produced 
Cynoceropteryx, the first known non-bird dinosaur with feathers. Euteranus, which is not only a tyrannosaur, a dialogue is also from here, the feathered tyrannosaurs, which, along with a bunch of other finds, demonstrated how widespread feathers and proto-feathers were among theropod dinosaurs. Also, Euteranus, the largest known feathered dinosaur. Yeah. Big, a one-ton animal or so. Which was a big deal because we had for a long time just thought like, oh, the tiny ones were sure. fuzzy. But that was like, no, no. That's a, that's a rhino-sized animal. This is a scary animal <laughs> that is fuzzy. Microraptor and others like it. Dinosaurs that aren't birds but seem to have very bird-like wings and feathers. Microraptor has been interpreted as having at least gliding capabilities. Tian Yulong, the first known ornithischian dinosaur with feather-like integument. So this, this, the, the Jehol by Hoda went, here's Cynoceropteryx. Some dinosaurs that weren't birds had feathers. And we went, cool. Some small theropods had feathers. And we went, cool. Some close relatives of birds had feathers. And then the Jehol Biota went, here's a bunch of others. And we went, whoa, okay, a bunch of theropods had feathers. Small theropods. And then it went, here's Euteranus. And we went, oh, big theropods too. And then it went, here's a dinosaur from the other side of the dinosaur family tree yep. that has what might be feathers. Yep. Most of the milestones in the feather dinosaur discussion have come from the same area. And tons more. Not only different kinds of feathers, different styles of feathers, feathers for display and feathers possibly for warmth and feathers for flight, but also pigments preserved within the feathers. This is also where tons of research has gone into not only how were these dinosaurs using these feathers, but what did the feathers look like? Evidence of the coloration of these feathers. Feathers have been a major source of study. Uh, for paleontologists trying to understand how widespread were they and what does the evolution of feathers look like. Also, that's another one of those categories that we've referenced before of coloration is a thing that if you asked us... Right, 20 years ago. Yeah, we'd have been like, sorry, we're just going to have to guess. Nope. That's just, we're going to have to speculate. We're going to have to compare it. We just won't know that. And then J-Hole went, no, no, we got you. But actually... No, no, here you go. <laughs> here you go. And Here's again, some pretty banding. Not just the Jehol Biota, yes. but very prominently the Jehol Biota. Another fossil that I, I want to mention, I'm going to mention it now because it doesn't fit in any of my other categories, but every every paper I read mentioned it. So I was like, I'll mention it too. Uh, a troodontid, mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. small meat-eating dinosaur closely related to birds, named Maylong. Not found with feathers, but preserved in a bird-like sleeping posture. Right. Right, right. Which was a big deal when it was found. Yes, I remember. I recognized the name, but I couldn't remember what it was about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Sleeping like a bird. Very cute. And speaking of which, let's shift over from feathers to one of the other biggest deal topics of study in the Jehol Biota, bird evolution. Boids. One study that I read said that the Jehol Biota is arguably the most important Mesozoic bird assemblage. Wow. Tons of birds, and not only lots of birds, not only lots of well-preserved birds, but birds and near-bird dinosaurs documenting the various phases and styles of bird evolution. There is probably no better place in the world to study bird evolution, the early evolution of birds. The Jehol Biota includes birds... Like the aptly named Jeholornis, mm -hmm. which is very similar to Archaeopteryx, a very ancestral style bird, looks a lot like dinosaurs. Confucius Ornus is from here, an important bird for representing more modern features in birds, like the piga style structure in the tail. Jehol also includes the earliest known members of the two groups of birds that went on to be the most important birds in the Mesozoic the Enantiorniths and the Euorniths. So we've got these early phases of bird evolution showing the various traits and where they showed up and a bit of when they showed up on top of all these non-birds that were very closely related to birds, which were experimenting with bird traits, with feathers and with flight and with body size. So we've got just that you could ignore every other fossil locality in the world and just study the Jehol Biota and get a really good idea of what bird evolution looked like. Yeah, you'd be able to write 
bird evolution textbooks. Yes. That would cover a ton of the info. <laughs> that's that's a huge one. Well, once again, for birds, that's yes. such a big deal. We have so many times where we just kind of have to shrug and go, well, hopefully I, we'll find some more birds. Yeah. I, we just didn't get many birds from this site again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> This is a huge, huge deal, and that's so cool. Very, very cool. Speaking of the early evolution of important groups, another group that gets a bunch of research focus from Jehol is plants. Yeah. There are fossils here that have been looked at as important evolutionary phases in groups like ginkgos and cycads and conifers, but also, as I mentioned before, some of the earliest possible angiosperms. Yeah are known from here. Episode 57, we talked about flowering plants. We've talked about it a bunch of different episodes. During the Cretaceous, flowering plants took over the world. Yes. Today, flowering plants, are they rule the world. As I said, they continue to reign dominant. They continue dominant. to <laughs> rule over the world. <laughs> the, Angie, the, the shift from earlier plant communities to flowering plant-filled communities was a major ecological shift. That happened in the Cretaceous, and here in the Jehol Biota, we have what might be the earliest signs of it. Yeah. And while we're on the note of plants, moving to a very adjacent topic, insects. Mm -hmm. Here's another quote that I pulled from a, a paper that I read. Probably more papers have been published on insects than on any other Jehol fossil group. Wow. Insects have received tons of research attention. Because like birds, you don't get a lot of fossil sites with really well-preserved, diverse assemblages of insect fossils. Yeah, because so often sediment is too aggressive, too abrasive. Yeah, or not fine enough. It yeah. just doesn't capture the detail or sometimes anything that you want for insect fossils. But it's like trying to use old graphics. You know, if you're using you know 8 or 16-bit graphics, you can only get down to such detail if right. you're using coarse sediment, the insects are too small for that sediment to even acknowledge the antenna. Right. Here we can actually do that, which is a, which awesome. The Jehol biota includes early members of many major groups, including subgroups of Coleoptera, beetles, Diptera, flies and cousins, Hymenoptera, woo, ants and bees and such, and Siphonoptera, fleas. Ooh. Not only early members of these groups, but early evidence of important lifestyles among insects, including things like mimicry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very importantly, parasitism, especially fleas, ectoparasites on animals, and pollinating structures. Oh, yep. Insect structures for carrying pollen, for visiting flowers, which, hand in hand with evidence of early angiosperm evolution, one of the reasons why flowering plants were able to take over the world they did is because they partnered up with the animals that had already taken over the world. Yes. And then hand in hand, they skipped into the future. Plant insect co-evolution is widely cited as one of the main reasons for the diversity and abundance of both plants and insects. Yeah. At Jehol, we have evidence of the early relationships between plant, flowering plants and insects. This, this is the moment where insects were saying, hey, new kid, stick with us. Yeah. <laughs> You'll go places. <laughs> also, the Jehol biota includes evidence of early crucial steps in the evolution of mammals, including important studies on the evolution of the inner ear, which is a very iconic mammal feature. So just all sorts of cool research opportunities on the origins of groups of life that are so important ever since then. Well, I feel like it's also so noteworthy because, at least from a popular standpoint, so often the in Cretaceous gets discussed and brought up very, very often. Sure. And we have way more fossil sites. Yes. And way more famous fossil sites from the later Cretaceous. As absolutely. But it's not often that we get to experience a really detailed deep dive into the early Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. So it's no wonder that we're getting tons of amazingly insightful discoveries and information because we're dealing with a period that we haven't gotten to analyze as heavily. Yeah. And that it's, it's like if you just missed out on a chapter of a person's life when they went to college, that 
they're going to come back a different person. This is, you're getting this insight yeah. into a time. We jumped from the Morrison formation to the Cloverleaf formation, and we just missed all this important development. Yes. All the character development that was going on yeah. in the early Cretaceous. Who's that? I think the Cloverly might be early Cretaceous. I don't know. Some, <laughs> some, someone who knows that better. <laughs> well, I was going to say Hell Creek, but I was like, that's a huge jump. We got stuff that's earlier than the Hell Creek. I don't know. Audience, pick your own, your your favorite choice for what I should have said. And then you can yeah. rewrite the joke for yourself and then have a good laugh. And then laugh about it. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're clever. We do it. We work together. Well, we want to make our jokes accessible. We <laughs> make the joke that works best for you. Another important subject of research made possible by the fossils of the Jahul Biota is fossil diets. Yeah. One of the things that's super famous about the Jahul Biota is abundant gut contents. <laughs> Complete specimens with stuff in their bellies that tell us what they eat. One of my favorite studies of all time that I cited this in an episode recently when we were answering a patron question. Yes. A 2019 study did a review of gut content specimens from the Jahul Biota and counted 20 examples of, uh, and they used the term trophic interactions <laughs> which means this thing ate that thing which we know from gut content specimens and included among them are the following seeds have been found in the guts of at least three different birds fish have been found in the guts of birds small dinosaurs other small reptiles both bird and mammal remains have been found in the guts of dinosaurs and other birds Lizards have been found in the guts of small dinosaurs, including one of the lizards, which was identified as a new species mm -hmm. from the remains in the guts of a microraptor. Yes. Uh, they named it Indrosaurus, named after an Indian deity who was swallowed by a dragon. Oh, right. In yes. legend. We've talked about that one before, too. Such a cool name. <laughs> the remains of numerous small dinosaurs have been found inside the guts of Cenocalioptoryx, a larger theropod dinosaur. <laughs> And, very famously, the remains of Psittacosaurus, a juvenile dinosaur, the, the Ceratopsian dinosaur, remains of a juvenile Psittacosaurus inside the mammal Rapanomamus at about a meter long and 12 kilograms, 30 pounds estimated, among the largest Mesozoic mammals and the first ever evidence of a mammal having eaten a dinosaur. Which I remember distinctly that news coming out because it was, it was very much just a we need to stop treating it like mammals were just cowering. Yes. Non-stop to the, Cretace the this, Mesozoic. This one ate a baby dinosaur. Yeah, no, like <laughs> mammals were a part of the ecosystem as much as anyone was. This, all this information is fascinating because it, A, lots of information, B, allows us to construct an evidence-based food web, like a direct evidence-based food web, which they did in that paper, but also because these, these informations can tell us some things about the evolution of some of these animals. For example, that study compared gut contents known from different groups of birds and non-bird dinosaurs and found that many early birds and bird cousins were coughing up pellets yeah. of hard-to-digest foodstuffs, like a lot of birds do today, but Microraptor wasn't. It was swallowing and retaining and passing the hard-to-digest stuff, which provides us with some evidence to understand when that feature originated in the evolution of dinosaurs. Yeah. Which is a very cool thing to be able to get insight into. So neat. And then there are a bunch of other things that I won't go into more detail, but there's been tons of studies on reproductive evolution, since there's tons of great fossil remains of eggs and embryos of pterosaurs, birds, dinosaurs, charistodires, lizards, including eggs, eggs with embryos in them, animals with embryos in them. There was a, a, at least one pregnant charistodire. <laughs> so tons of research about reproductive behavior. At least one famous instance of a group of psittacosaurs that seem to be a family group all gathered together. And there's been tons of studies in Jahul about fossilization, especially as it relates to microstructures and pigmentation and mole specific molecules, because it's a great case study on how do those things fossilize. Like the news we discussed with the scallops, how does the fossilization process affect what evidence we're getting left behind? In these exceptionally preserved fossils, there is no end to the list of fascinating questions 
that can be asked and potentially answered with the fossils of the Jahol biota. And as we have mentioned on many of these topics over the course of this discussion, this is still happening. Yes. We are still working on this, the, the, these sites. We are still working on these fossils. Tons of them are already in museum dis- uh, collections and being researched from there. And plenty are still being investigated in the field and excavated. And as far as I know, there does not seem to be any indication that the Jahol formations are running out of fossils. Mm-mm. So we will likely continue to make more incredible discoveries and more fascinating research to keep answering all these questions that we're still not sure about and then find more questions to ask that we didn't even think to ask yet. Yeah. Well, it's it's a situation of we can find more stuff to refine all the things we are currently trying to understand. But they could also just pop up with another, like, oh, here's another thing with feathers. Right. <laughs> Evidently. Now we have more questions to ask. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's a thing that happened. It's there's there's so much that's already going on there. I have no clue what to expect to happen in the future. So look forward to more research on the fossilization there, the ecosystem, the habitat, the geologic conditions, the climate, the evolution of these groups, and so on. I'm sure we will mention fossils from the Jahol biota. Many, many times in the future of the podcast, especially in the news section. But for now, uh, that will end our discussion for this episode of the Jahal Biota. Check out the blog post. There'll be a bunch more links and a bunch of cool pictures. Uh, A number of the papers that I found are open access and they have great pictures in them. So I'll share some of those in the blog post so you can see what some of these fossils actually look like. Excellent. But before we finish the whole episode, uh, finally, there is one last thing to do. And that is our patron question. One of the benefits that patrons can get on our Patreon is the ability to ask us questions to answer right here on the podcast at the end of the episode. Will, what is this episode's patron question? This question is from Suzanne, who asks, What is the actual difference between taxonomy, phylogeny, and cladistics? Are they shades of meaning of the same basic concept? Are they wildly different, or are they kind of interchangeable as terms? That is an excellent question. Yes. Uh, We've used these terms a lot on the podcast. Taxonomy, phylogeny, cladistics, all referring to the way that we categorize and understand relationships between organisms. Uh, But they are all different. There is some overlap between how they're used. There's also some inconsistency in the way that some of these terms are used. But briefly, here's what these terms mean. Mm -hmm. Taxonomy is giving names to things. Yes. Uh, This doesn't have to be biology, but usually taxonomy refers to biology. That is naming species, families, and so on. Taxonomy typically goes hand in hand with classification. Yes. Classification is just putting things in categories, putting things in boxes. Taxonomy is naming those categories. So this is, you find a new species and you say, all right, you are in this overall group, in this more specific group, and a new species. So now here is your taxonomic name. Here's your name. Phylogeny, typically when that term is used, it refers to the evolutionary tree of life, the evolutionary relationships between organisms. Who's related to who, what the ancestors were, what are the common ancestors phylogenetics is a term that's often used to refer to the study of those relationships. Um, Although phylogeny, phylogenetics, you'll hear these terms used in sort of various overlapping ways. But phylogeny is the hierarchical evolutionary relationships between organisms. How are the groups related to each other? How have those groups split over time to give us the individual groups and species that we now have? Right. Which is an important thing to understand for classification. We can classify organisms however we want. We can classify them by color and by size. Phylogeny is important for us to classify them by their evolutionary relationships. So when we're naming things through taxonomy, we're typically naming them within that phylogenetic tree. We're saying, all right, you're in birds, so you're in this branch of the tree. You're a hawk, so you're in this branch of that branch. Right. So we're using that as our guide to taxonomy. Cladistics is a method of studying and understanding phylogeny. 
Mm-hmm. There are many me- there are different methods we use uh, broadly. This is called systematics, which is the science of trying to sort out the phylogeny, the evolutionary relationships. The way it's used sometimes, phylogeny can be thought of as the true evolutionary relationships between organisms. And systematics, cladistics, are methods we use to hypothesize about those relationships. Yes. So we use systematics to come up with a hypothesis. We say, we think this is the true evolutionary relationship, the true phylogeny of these groups. Cladistics specifically is the modern day most popular and commonly used method for trying to interpret phylogenetic relationships, evolutionary relationships. Uh, It's not the only one. But it is the one that we're typically talking about these days when you're doing systematic studies. Cladistics specifically interprets relationships in terms of clades. So a clade is the common ancestor that split into descendants. The ancestor and all its descendants form a clade. Cladistics is focused on comparing ancestral features that organisms share that they inherited from their ancestor and derived features which lineages evolved different from their ancestors and we use this framework to interpret evolutionary relationships cladistics is a methodology it also is a philosophy of how to think about evolutionary relationships it is where we end up in those discussions about birds are dinosaurs and should we use the term reptiles because from a cladistics perspective if you are descended from ancestors you're part of that group yeah if everything that originated from this initial branch this initial node on the phylogenetic tree falls within that clade if that's where you start that clade right so if birds evolved from dinosaurs birds are dinosaurs Mm -hmm. if reptiles doesn't refer to birds but birds are part of the reptile clade then the reptile the term reptile is not a good scientific term some would argue from that cladistic perspective of wanting to structure our phylogeny and our taxonomy around the cladistic methodology and the cladistics is not like a set like you can start a clade at any point in the tree and interpret everything that branches from that point as a clade this is why you get people going by that logic, aren't we fish? If you start the clade far enough back with earliest vertebrates, then yeah, we would. That would. That's where you get those kind of uh, debates that come up. So, in short, taxonomy is naming things in a classification scheme. Phylogeny is the evolutionary relationships between organisms. Cladistics is a modern method of understanding and studying and thinking about those evolutionary relationships between organisms. Yeah. And that is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because we do use those terms and it's mm-hmm. nice every now and then to, to to take a break and go, all right, here's what this actually means. Well, and I, I appreciate the refresher. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I definitely would have had trouble defining those cold turkey. Like just I did have to go to the internet yeah. and be like, all right, what? Because like I said, there is some overlap and there is some inconsistency yes. with how certain terms are used in different contexts. But that's the general idea. And yeah, they some of them are often used interchangeably. Well, in some context, especially because a lot of times you're you're using two or three of them at the same time. You know, right. if you're doing one, you're typically using another to do it to, you know, to do your task in the other. So they're parallel very often when being discussed that. Right. They're being discussed simultaneously, almost interchangeably. So thank you for asking that question, Suzanne. Thank you to all of our patrons who support us, the new ones we shouted out at the top of the episode, and all the old ones that have been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Thank you to everyone who requested this episode topic. This is a fascinating discussion. Yes. Thank you to everybody who listens. That means you, if there's something you'd like to hear us talk about, as always, reach out to us in any of the ways you find links to down in the episode description and let us know what topics you'd like to request. There will be a blog post, as there always is for every episode, with links and images and more info for people who want to delve deeper and learn more. Don't forget to listen to Spooky from last month if you haven't already. Don't forget to keep your eyes out for the the end-of-the-year Q&A submission form, which will be opening in mid-November and open till mid-December. Don't forget to use the link in the episode description for Audible to sign up if you want to support us and also get access to some audiobooks. Don't forget to join our Discord and follow us on social media and all the things that you can do to follow and support the podcast. 
We release episodes every fortnight. Episode 153 comes next. Only a few episodes left before the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm all talked out. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. Nah, this was a fun one. I, I'm going to be thinking about J-Hold Dinosaurs th- all, all, all week now. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Oda. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.